you to tell you how blessed I was uh, during worship today. It's it's a powerful thing to get to worship with this many people who really are passionate about Jesus. I mean, I I worship every week with thousands, but I worshiped with some people today that were just real passionate about who God is, and man, it was good for my soul. Uh, it was good for my soul to see a mic not work and someone still worship. Uh, and I guess today, there is lots of people in this place that are great preachers. Uh, they've studied it. There is people in this room that are great biblical scholars. Uh, and today, I just, I'm neither of those things. I'm really not. I, I love Jesus with everything I am. And I love people. And uh, so today, I just want to talk to you about that. Before that, though, there's just something God put on my heart, and I was sitting next to Debbie, and I said, Debbie, do I change my message 30 seconds before I walk up? And everything inside of me says, screaming, no. But my spirit's like, yeah. And I have a question for you. As you worship, are you God's fan, or are you his family? I travel with the University of Illinois basketball team all over the country, I see 18,000 fans screaming their name when they come out. I see them do chants. I see them sing songs. I see them cheer. I see them scream for 13 dudes. I also see them log on the internet and trash them after the games. I also see them after games booing them. And then before the next game, I see the same person asking for an autograph. Those are fans. What God wants is you to be his family. And what family is, is it's someone who's with you in the good times and the bad times. What family is, is someone who will hold your hand when you're sick. And what family is, is is not basing your life on the measures of a world, but basing your life on the measures of Jesus, our man. And so today, before we even get into the text, I just feel like, students, it's so easy to be a fan of God. What's not to like? He's awesome. He has saved us. We'll rise. It's easy for us to get excited and sing songs about him. But he's calling you to be part of his family. And today, as I talk, that's what I'm going to talk about today is is how do we do that? So before we start, let me share a word of prayer. God, I love you. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. Lord, I am so blessed to be here. God, I thank you for this institution. I thank you for all the graduates that have come uh, from her. And I am so grateful for how you have impacted the world through a small college in Joplin, Missouri. I am grateful that you continue to use this place And Lord, I pray right now that you will give me the words to say to encourage the students, the adults, uh, the professors, the staff, everyone who's here. And God, I just pray that you reveal something new to everybody. Uh, God, I pray that you open up their eyes to something that is yet unseen. God, I'm giving you myself and I pray that you use me. Give me the words you desire for me to say. Take away the things you don't want me to. God, I just, as we journey in these next 20 minutes, allow us just to know who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know what happened to me? I was a junior in high school. I went to a conference. Uh, the truth was, is, is Greg Hafer was there at that conference. He was doing Encounter. It was in Bolivar, Missouri. Uh, it was really hot outside and it was miserable. My youth minister, actually I'm from Grinnell, Iowa. My youth minister's here today. We didn't even know we were going to be here at the same time. And I see this bald, good-looking dude walk in, and he sees a short, thrumpy-looking fellow sitting in the front. He's like, Brian, Jason. And, uh, but it's cool. And he was there that day, and I remember I was sitting in the middle of an auditorium, and, and uh, I remember this other short, chubby guy named Robin Sigers was preaching. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know him at all in that moment. And he stood on the front of that stage, and he preached a sermon. And during that sermon, I asked the question. I, I just begged God. God, if you want me to do this, like if, if you want me to be your guy in ministry and preach the gospel, then, then you, and I just kind of laid it down. I'm going to be honest. My theology wasn't great. I was like, you need to do this now because if not, 
I'm going to go play football somewhere. I'm going to go where they'll pay me and I'm going. And Robin preaches this sermon and he walks off. It was a good sermon. I mean, it was, it was all right. (laughs) And, uh, he walked off stage and I remember I was relieved for a moment. And then he came right out behind those curtains like this and he stood like this. And he said these words. If you know you need to be preaching the gospel, then do it. Just do it. In that moment, I was consumed. I'm consumed right now just talking about it, to be honest. I was overwhelmed with this idea that I can't go do what I want to do. And I was broken and I wept. And I made my way to the front of an auditorium. And from that moment on, I had to give up things that I loved. My senior year came and I played football. And the crazy thing was is I had a better season than I even expected. And telling coaches that you wouldn't even speak to them, not answering phone calls. When coaches would show up at your school and everyone was excited that coach was there. And I wouldn't even go talk to them. uh, It was hard. The town didn't understand it. Because their measure of success was different than mine. I made a decision to be a youth minister. Now I'm 33, going to be 34 years old, and people still wonder, Jason, why are you still working with high school students? Why don't you go preach? Why aren't you in a foreign field? And the answer is pretty simple is, I work with adults every day. I preach to them twice a month. And I see adults changing their priorities. I see adults changing their families. But I see students changing the world. And I can't get away from it. It's intoxicating. See, the thing I want to talk to you guys about today is this. The way the the world measures success, you guys, is broke. See, what I'm trying to say is, is the way the world measures success also bleeds itself into the church. It bleeds itself into the youth ministry that I'm able to serve. See, the way the world measures success is when I'm on a road trip with the University of Illinois, whether we play well or we play poorly, if we win the game, we're successful. That a coach keeps his job or loses his job based on wins and losses versus on graduation rate. See, the world is broke. See... The way we measure success in our ministries or in the corporate world is in our ministries, the way we measure success is on numbers. We objectify it. Our elders or our staff hold us accountable to it. And every single Monday we sit and we wait for the email to come across the page that says in your inbox to say there was 20 people there or 2,000 or 20,000. And if it's high, you're happy. And if it's low, you're sad. See, the way we measure success is when we see the financial statement come out and it tells us how much offering has been given, we're either excited because God was faithful or we're depressed that people didn't listen. And see, the way we measure success is, isn't it funny, students, how every time someone is called into a different youth ministry or into a different field, they always get paid more and it's always a bigger church. Isn't it funny that in the world, they call it headhunting in the corporate world. They call it headhunting. That's literally what they call it. In baseball or football, they call it free agency. In the church, we call it the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And students, I can't handle it anymore. It is a burden. Because it's the world I live in. And it's the world you're going to be living in. See, in our lives, we measure our success based on the cars that we drive, based on the friends that we have. We measure our success on our 403B. We measure our success that someday we can retire and stick our feet in the sand. But see, the most successful points in my ministry is not preaching at a chapel at Ozark Christian College. It's not preaching in front of a bunch of students. It's not talking to a group of Division I coaches. It's not talking to a church on Sunday morning. The most successful moments of my ministry is when I was standing in the Black Sea and I watched God be successful in saving someone's life. 
See, the moments that are the most successful for me is when I was sitting in a hut in Africa and I watched a boy be cured before my eyes because, see, I have nothing to do with the success of this world. God is who is successful. There's been only one successful thing that's ever happened. And it was Christ risen. And when people come to know Him, I get to witness success. But students, if you base your lives on anything else, if you base your ministries on anything else, listen to me. There's emptiness. I've been there. And so how do we measure our hearts? How do we measure our successes? And I believe we have to ask ourselves two questions to look. Because I think the only way we can measure ourselves is to look at our hearts. It can't be on what I do. Because what I do is sinful and wretched. And when I look at a heart, and I I look at people's heart today, I think the question that we have to ask to look inside our hearts is this, and and, and, uh, this is what I think we need to do, is what drives you? You know, when you get up in the morning, what geeks you up? You know, when I was in elementary school, the only thing that drove me to go to school every day is I knew I had practice on Saturday, and if I missed a day of school, my parents wouldn't let me practice. So when I sat in math class in elementary school, I was driven for Saturday to go to practice. In high school, I was driven to get through school so I could go lift weights, so I could go run, so I could be bigger, faster, and stronger. And see, now in life, I think if we look at our hearts today, students and adults, I think that in the world today, there's something that drives most hearts, and it's this. It's money. It's possessions. It's earthly things. If you don't think that's true, I'm telling you that in in ministry in Champaign, Illinois, when the stock market crashed, I'm telling you what, the doors got blown off the opportunities to minister to people because they had no idea what was happening. Their whole security was wrapped up in a 403B. And if you don't think that money matters, then why are we so concerned when we go for that interview how much we're going to get paid? Why is it that when we do internships at First Christian Church in Champaign and we won't pay anybody, I can't get anybody to come? We should pay people. But I still can't get anybody to come. So if you think money doesn't matter and it doesn't drive you, I think you need to look pretty deep. If you don't think money matters, uh, be in ministry for a while. Have a wife who you love and children who you love and see them not have the things that other people have. And tell me it doesn't bother you. Man, it bothers me that my wife can't drive a vehicle that she's proud of. It does. Something else I think that drives the heart of us is it's power <laughs> it does if you don't think power drives this world look back in history whether it was Hitler conquering a nation whether it was Alexander the Great conquering constant nations or whether it's a college guy who is sitting in the gym and that girl walks in and he tears down all of his friends to be more powerful than them whether it's a group of girls sitting in the cafe and when that other girl walks in they assert their power over her and talking and belittling her If you don't think power matters, then why do we measure everything based on bigger and better and nicer and cooler? If power doesn't matter, then... Man, Jason, I just got to figure out how I can use my gifts to the greatest impact of the kingdom so I can make the biggest impact... So because of that, there's no way I should ever preach at a church of 100. I've got to preach at a church of 30 million. Because there's more power. There's more. I preach at a big church. I'm not bagging big church. 
But it's not about power, it's about calling. It's not about success, it's about faithfulness. And I think you need to ask yourself the question. Another thing I think describes our hearts, and I'm a horrible artist as you can see. Got to make sure I stay inside the heart. It's connecting to other people. It's relationships. That's what drives us. Whether it's when you were in high school and and you had to do everything possible to be in this crowd, or whether it's in college you stay up late at night praying for that one girl or one guy to notice you, but your deepest desire is to be connected. If you don't think that you desire to be connected, look at the clothes you wear. Why on earth would a guy ever wear girl jeans if he didn't want to connect with other guys who wear girl jeans? It's true. Why would I ever wear... I wear sweatpants all the time when I'm on road trips with the basketball team because I connect with guys who wear sweatpants. They're not cool still, but I like them. But your desire to connect drives you. You get up in the morning and I promise you, lots of you look in the mirror. Do you look in the mirror so you can connect to God better or do you look in the mirror so people will like to look at you? See, if you looked in the mirror because you were concerned about your relationship with Jesus, then you'd look in the mirror on that Saturday when you spent all day at home. But that day you don't shower and you maybe don't even brush your teeth. Some of these things are at your worst and at my worst. Some of these things are at our average. Some of these things are still there when we're at our best. There's another heart I think we need to look at. Before we do that, though, I've got to say one more thing. I just like flipping pages. This is what drives you. You know another way to tell what's on your heart? What do you pray about? My guess is there's times you pray about this a little too much. Now we're really flipping the page. There's another heart we need to look at today in order for us to measure. And this heart is God's. And these are the things that are on God's heart. See, what's on God's heart is you. See, what's on God's heart when you look in Scripture was as He was teaching at His best and also at His worst and sometimes at His average, when God was busy, when He was doing things, when Jesus was on this earth, when, when you see Him at His best and when you see His heart is, when He's busy and a woman is thrown down on the streets, she's dragged into a room, she's naked, she's beaten, she's being drugged by her hair like a caveman, thrown down in His presence, and a bunch of men and boys are grabbing stones, just getting ready to stone her, and Jesus sees her off in the distance, this woman who does Deserves to be stoned by the law. She deserves it. He runs to her aid. Why? Because his heart is that person. He runs to her aid. He draws a line in the sand. He draws something in the sand. And he looks at him and he says these words. Hey, you who've never messed up, throw away. And see, then he takes off his cloak and he covers his, her naked body. And go. Sin no more. Or whether it's a leper, and as, as he's teaching, and, and this leper makes his way through the crowd, just imagine it. If a leper walks into this room during ancient times, and they walk in, and what do they have to shout? They shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. And as they shout unclean, the crowds start to part. 
People start to get out of the way. They cover their nose. They don't want to be close. The truth is they're probably cursing and yelling at him. Hey, get away. We're here to listen to Jesus. He's not for you. Go back outside. Get outside the camp. This isn't the place for you. And he keeps moving forward and moving forward. But Jesus just doesn't let him come to him. You see Jesus do something else. You see Jesus walk off that mountain. He heads right towards that man. And as this leper comes towards him, who hasn't been touched for years, who probably hasn't been spoken to, who hasn't been loved, Jesus, before he heals him, does something, doesn't he? What does he do? He reaches out and he touches him. And when Jesus touches that leper, and he heals him, and a man that came towards him, shouting from the top of his lungs, unclean, 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 walks away saying, free at last, free at last. Oh, Lord God Almighty, I'm free at last. See, his heart is you. You know why else you know his heart is you? And reconciling you to the cross is when you see him walk into the temple. Look at what makes him angry. He walks into the temple and his heart is broken because of all the things going on in the temple. He tosses over table. He brings out the whips. Why? Because people are standing in the way of others knowing his grace and his mercy. If you want to break the heart of God, if you want to, if you want to make him angry, stand between him and his grace. See, what's on God's heart is quite simply you. And reconciling it to himself. Well, that's what drives him. What does he pray about? John chapter 17. Uh, I'm not going to have time to read the whole passage today. But in John 17, you're Bible college students. I shouldn't have to break this down this much. At the very beginning of that passage, who does he pray for? You guys can speak out loud. It's okay. Himself. As, As he begins this prayer, he prays for himself. But you know what he prays for himself? He prays for himself that he'll have the power and that he'll have the ability to reconcile the world. He prays that he'll be glorified. He prays that he'll have the strength to go to the cross. And then right after he does that, who does he pray for? His apostles, his followers, his disciples. And he prays that they will be protected, not from harm. He doesn't pray that they're protected from death from persecution, from being made fun of, from suffering. He prays that they'll be protected from the evil one and that they will be one as the Father and Him are one. See, He prays that He'll have the strength to reconcile the world. He prays that His followers will have the strength to reconcile the world. And then in the end of the chapter, He prays, for you. That's right. Students, Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for you, Hunter. He prayed for you, Miguel. He prayed for you, Sarah. And he prayed that you would be reconciled to him. And he prayed that the church globally would be one. So our question today is, fan or family, how do we measure success? And I think we need to take a look at, this is God's heart. What does yours look like? I think sometimes we don't realize how concerned God is with us. I think I have the ability to do this, and I don't know if you do too, but sometimes I view God through my own lens. And I sometimes picture God sitting on the porch with sweet tea. Real sweet. Just kind of waiting to send Jesus back to earth. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, 
Verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. As some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting any one of you to perish. But everyone, everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. See, what drives the heart of God is that the world may know Him. What drives the heart of God is that you'll be reconciled, brought to Him, and that you can spend eternity with Him and this moment with Him. See, guys, what the heart of God is, come to me now so you can be with me later. See, in this world, they tell you success is very different than that. They say that it's okay to do whatever you want. It's okay to climb that ladder. It's okay to measure things in this way. But listen to me. The heart of God is about people, and it's about the cross. And the question for us today is, when he comes back, when every knee bows, when every tongue confesses, for those who are on heaven, those who are on earth, and those who are under the earth, and every knee bows... Will you be bowing next to brothers and sisters in Christ? See, the question is, are you going to continue to measure your success on the world and being a fan of God? Or are you going to be his family? Because see, students, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are a friend of Christ. You are a joint heir with Jesus and you share in his inheritance. You are the temple, the dwelling place of God. His spirit and his life, they live in you. You have been reconciled to God through the power of reconciliation. And now, students, you are a minister of that reconciliation. You are a citizen. You are a saint. You are an enemy of Satan, but you know what? The evil one, he cannot touch you. Do you know why? The reason he cannot touch you is because you are a child of the living God. So join his family. Stop being his fan. Measure yourself on the heart of a man versus on the deeds of a man. Students, it's time for you to take off your spiritual diapers. It's time for you to rise up on wings like eagles. It's time for you to run and not grow tired. It's time for you to walk and not grow weary. It's time for the church to be one. Versus just a bunch of fans shouting the name of God. He desires you. When Abe was learning to walk, it was four years ago, I remember... I would lean forward because I wanted to catch him if he fell, but I also was just excited. And I remember when he took that first step, it was like, yes, Lacey, look at this. Our kid can walk. He's only three. He was early on. But guys, God is so concerned with the world. He's so concerned with natural disasters. He's so concerned with people starving. He's so concerned with all those things. But let me tell you what else he is so concerned with. You. And you have a God in heaven who's not sitting on a rocking chair drinking sweet tea. You have a God in heaven who's leaning forward. And he's wanting you to take another step. He wants you to take another step towards him. So that he can transform your heart. And make it. Like his. Let's pray. God, I love you. I'm so thankful that you have called us to something greater. God, I pray a prayer over these students right now that you will just allow them to see what you can do in them. God, I pray that they throw away the thoughts of this world and how we measure success. And I pray that they're just consumed by taking the next step towards you. God, allow us. And thank you for letting us into your family. Help us to bring other fans into your family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed.